Okay, so let's do it again. Um, my name is uh, Lim Le Quang. I'm a grandmaster from Vietnam. My feeder rating is 2718, and I'm currently ranked number 30 in the world now. Um, in this webinar, I'm going to teach you about the, the pawn structure that um, usually arises in in one of your in, in your tournament games. This is called, and as you all know, um, in the middle games, all players have to decide uh, which plan to play according to the to the type of pawn structure that arises uh, on the board. So, in my opinion, knowing um, the the plans, how to play, how to attack, how to defend with white and with black in the Maroxi by pawn structure is very important to get a good results for your tournaments. Um, so I have made a five hour chess course um, to, to teach you about five different type of pawn structures. And uh, you can find the link to my chess course in the description below my product. So this is uh, the Maroxi byte structure. It is defined as white having the pawn on c4 and e4 and black has the pawn on d6. So usually this pawn structure arises from um, the Sicilian opening when the white d pawn is exchanged by the black c pawn. And then white has seven pawns, black also has seven pawns, um, but white has a little bit more space. So there are many different plans in this type of positions. Um, usually white has good control in the center, especially the d5 square. And so white can try to attack both on the king side and the queen side. On the king side, white can try with f4, f5, or maybe e5. And on the king side, sorry, on the queen side, uh, white can try with b4 and c5. Black, on the other hand, uh, usually has a fiancé shadow bishop on g7. So this bishop controls the long diagonal. And this bishop is usually very valuable for black because uh, not only that it defends the dark squares around the black's king, but it also put a lot of pressures on, on the long diagonal. And uh, black's position is very flexible. Black doesn't have any real weakness. Uh, so with these pawns on uh, d6 and g6, uh, they are very solid and control the center also. And usually black can try to maneuver his pieces. For example, uh, trying to play with a6 and b5. Or sometimes even f5. So um, black try to attack the pawn on c4, e4. Also with the pieces like bishop to e6, knight to e5, or knight to c5 to put pressure on uh, these two pawns on, on e4 and c4. Uh, black has a semi-open fire, the c5, to put the rook on c8. And um, white has the semi-open d5, so he can put the rook on b1 and maybe the other rook on e1 or, or c1. So this is the general plan. Uh, I will show you how we usually get this type of structure and then we will move on to um, to see a few uh, Grandmaster games and see how they um, handle this type of positions.
Yes, I see some very interesting questions. Um, Elia, you are asking about um, can both plan work for white at the same time? So it really depends. Um, usually, it, both these plans B4 and, and F4 doesn't work, um, doesn't combine very well with each other. You should just choose one of them. So if you play B4, then you should have the other pawn on F3. And if you play F4, then probably you should have the other pawn on B3. So just in, in case uh, you don't have too many weaknesses on both sides of the ball. So um, if you attack the, the queen side, then you need to be solid on the king side and vice versa. It's hard to say which plan is better. Um, it depends on um, certain positions and how you plan to attack your opponent. So uh, let's see how we usually get to that position. So the, the Marxi byte uh, structure usually arises from um, the Sicilian opening. For example, this variation is called the accelerated dragon uh, variation. And white can play c4 here, bishop g7, bishop e3. So you can see that um, we get to this type of position where white has these two pawns in the center. So the pawns on c4 and e4, they control d5 and makes it harder for black to break through in the center. Um, usually black play d6 and white play bishop e2. There's another um, advantage uh, of white in this position that is white's plans are very flexible. You can choose um, to attack on the queen side or the king side and usually white enjoys more space. So it's easier to play for white. On the other hand, uh, this, this pawn on c4 and e4, uh, the kind of limits uh, the activity of white's white, um, light square bishop. So this John e2 doesn't have um, much space to go and it's limited by its own pawns on c4 and e4 and usually white also play f3 later on um so let's play a few more moves here for example castle castle bishop d7 so usually black will try to exchange a, a pair of knights in the center because when you are the side with less space um you better exchange a few pieces so your other pieces have more space to maneuver so if uh it is usually useful for black to exchange uh this pair of knight and then this bishop on d7 uh, can either go to c6 or e6 to target um white pawn on on d4 sorry on c4 and e4 and also black will try to uh, play with either a5, a4, or sometimes a6, b5. Um, this knight on f6 also sometimes go to d7, c5, and then black can try f5 later. So um, I would like to show you one game. Um, this is uh, the game between Grandmaster Lenik Luka and myself in the Aeroflot Open Tournament in 2011. So we started with the English opening, but, but then it transposed to the uh, Maruzi uh, pawn structure. It was black in this game. I would just uh, flip the ball just to easier for me to, to see it. Oh, okay, we get to this same position that I just showed you. And uh, here, my opponents play a very natural move, rook c1. There's also, this move is also possible, knight c2. So in some uh, cases, white decided to keep uh, this knight on the ball. So because white believe that uh, if he has more space, he should re um, keep more pieces. Um, this move is playable for white. Sometimes this knight can go to um, a3 later, 
especially if black try to play with a5, a4, then this knight on a3 will be very useful because it stops black from playing a3, um, and then that knight can go to b5 later and reactivate the knight again. So um, this knight c2 is also possible, and black usually try with, uh, for example, rook c8, and then knight e5, um, a6, and b5. So, and white, on the other hand, tries something like queen d2, b3, a4 to uh, control the b5 square. So this is also a playable plan. Um, in the game, Remaster Linux, uh, Luca played rook c1, and I decided to exchange the knight, as I told you, to get more space for my, my bishop. And then I put my bishop on c6. So um, when I put my bishop on c6, I'm attacking e4. So my opponent has to play s3. So um, he is very solid on the king side and the center. So his, pl his plans must be to play b4 and try to attack on the queen side. So uh, in this position, the very typical plan for black is to try to exchange the dark square bishop with knight d7, um, offering the exchange uh, of the two bishops. So, um, and, and whites usually try to keep these bishops because um, it's quite valuable for, for white uh, to keep the bishop. Also, um, right here, bishop g7, well, if bishop g7, king g7, let's say queen d4, king g8, b4, uh, threaten to trap my bishop with b5, then I have this move, uh, queen b6. The idea is that if queen takes b6, knight takes b6, and my bishop has the, the d7 square to go back. And now, if white, um, when white already uh, advanced his pawns on the, on the queen side with b4, then c4 will become a weakness. Um, for my pieces to attack, so I can go rook fc8, bishop e7, bishop e6, and attack his pawn on c4. So when you're white and you uh, advance your pawns, you must be really careful because once the pawns are advanced, it cannot go backwards. So um, the the pawn on c4 in this case will become a permanent target for black, and uh, that's not a very good thing for white. So in the game, that's why my opponent go back with uh, bishop e3. So now he's threatening b4, um, and I have to continue with a5 to stop uh, b4, and also um, to have my own plan with a4, queen a5, um, and putting pressure on the queen side. Yeah, if you guys have any questions, just feel free to ask me on the, on the live chat, and I'll try to answer as many questions as possible. Um, yes, yeah, Senate, I see your questions about uh, exchanging the light square bishops from the bishop e5 in the CC land. Yes, I will I will talk about that um, soon after this game. So after a5, um, my opponent play b3 because he doesn't want to allow a4. So this move b3 is useful. Um, I continue with knight c5, queen d2, queen b6. So again, I renew my threat of uh, blind a4 and also giving space for my rook to c8. Um, my opponent played knight to b5. Uh, maybe he was trying to bring the knight back to d4. Um, in this position, knight d5 uh, is not particularly dangerous for black because I can exchange the bishop on c6 with the knight on d5. And after bishop d5, um, black is fine um, with any recapture from white. For example, if white recapture with the c-pawn, then I have rook fc8 and I'm very solid on the queen side. And next move, I would like to play queen b4 and a4. And if white recaptures with the queen, then I have a4 immediately attacking b3. So uh, that is good for, for black. And if it takes d5, then I also have the same idea with queen b4 and queen c2, a4. So I'm very active on uh, the queen side. 
Usually, if white exchange the knight on c3 with the bishop, uh, with the black light square bishop, then the remaining pieces of black are very active. Um, compared to the bishop on e2, it is rather passive, and therefore black has to be fine in this position. So, um, in the game, my opponents play knight to b5. So, if I exchange on b5, uh, this pawn required on b5. And will be good for white because then he has space for the bishop to c4 and maybe try a3 b4. So I don't want to exchange the knight on b5. So I just continue with rook fc8. And my opponent uh, makes some prophylactic move with king h1. And uh, so I also decided that my queen was not doing much on b6. And actually, it was um, under the pin uh, of the bishop. So I just Retreat the the queen to d8. So knight d4, bishop d7. I open the c5 from my rook. Rook f d1. So here's a very interesting position. Uh, what do you guys think uh, black should do in this position? How to activate my pieces? So uh, generally, a tip um, a tip for for chess players is that when you're not sure uh, what plans to do in certain positions, then just ask yourself the question, um, how to improve the placement of your pieces? Um, what would be the better squares for your pieces and uh, how, to you, how do you improve that? Um, even if you don't have any clear target uh, in mind, for example, in this position, wise is very solid and uh, I don't really have anything to do. Like B5 is not working, A4, uh, white on white has B4, F5 is too risky, so what should I do in this position? Okay, Bobby, uh, you asked about why I put the F rook to C8 and not the A rook. The answer is that I would like to keep the A rook on A8, so I might have the idea to play A4 later on. The f rook, on the other hand, um, if I don't plan to play f5, then it's not very useful on f8. So when I bring the f rook to c8, then I can bring the queen back to d8, and the queen will be um, more active, as you will see later on. So yeah, in the game, yes, I see some of you guys um, suggested the correct move. And uh, in the game, I play h5. The idea is that I would like to activate my queen along the long diagonal. So I would like to bring my king to h7 and then the queen to h8. So it puts more pressure on the long diagonal. It's, that is more active than, than the queen on d8. Um, so that's my plan to bring the queen to h8. So after h5, my opponent continue with bishop f1. Um, I play king h7, I play knight to e2, I play bishop c6, um, knight to f4. So maybe he was trying to bring the knight to d5. Um, usually when white play knight to d5, if black takes on d5, um, the most ambitious way for white to recapture is to, to take with the e pawn. So white has opened the e5, maybe the rook can go to e1. As you see here, like uh, if 95, 5 pd, um, then later on, I can try rook e1 and maybe f4, f5. So trying to attack on, on the uh, king side. Uh, for black, if I take on d5, but I don't manage to play something like queen b4 and a4 to open the queen side, then I would be very passive. So. That's his plan, knight to f4. But this move, knight f4, allow me to play bishop h6. So um, I try to exchange the dark square bishop. If the knight goes to d5, I will exchange on e3. So that is probably uh, good for black because, uh, again, I, am, um, I have less space. So it makes sense to exchange a few pieces. My opponents play queen to f2, threaten bishop takes c5. So I have to move my queen, and it should go to h8. Uh, that's the whole plan to play h5 and king h7. So 
um, my opponent's play rook to c2, queen f6. I put pressure on the knight on f4, and then now it has to go to d5, and I exchange it. Capture with the rook. Um, bishop e3, queen takes e3. So here's an interesting position to try to evaluate uh, this position. Uh, white still has more space, but the bishop on f1 is kind of passive. It is limited by its own pawns on e4 and c4. The knight on c5 is very well placed. Um, however, it doesn't do much thing at the moment. So the position should be around equal. I try to disrupt his pieces with queen a1, uh, attacking the bishop on f1. So king g1, 97. So I try to um, maneuver my knight to f6 and maybe try, uh, play rook c5. So here's an interesting moment because when I play this move 97, I had to calculate a few moves ahead. Um, because of what happened in the game is uh, is a series of fox move that I had to calculate, and it looks like Y is winning a pawn with Queen G5, double attack plus pawn on E7 and A5. So that's why my opponent played Queen to G5. I play Knight to F6, Rook takes A5. So he has won a pawn, but I have a tactic here. Um. Yeah, I see a question about e6. Um, usually in this uh, minority structure, you shouldn't play e6 because then the sixth pawn will become a permanent weakness and that's really hard to defend. So it's better to keep your pawns uh, flexible with e7 and d6. And um, there's also one little detail that when you play e6 and g6, then you have weakened the dark squares around uh, your king, and that's very dangerous. Um, in another chapter of this um, method, this chess course that I have, um, I also talk about the seven the seven again uh, pawn structure, and uh, that is very similar to this, but with the main difference that the black pawn is on g seven and e six instead of on g six and e seven. So uh, that that pawn structure. Um, is also very flexible for black and a lot of world champion play that, but it doesn't combine very well with uh, the other. So if you play e6, you should keep the, the other pawn on g7. And if you play g6, you should keep the e pawn on e7. So you cover the dark squares around your black king. And uh, yeah, for, for, for the seven again uh, pawn structure, you will find that more detail in my chess course um, if you buy my product. So, um, in the game, after knight f6, uh, rook takes a5, I calculated this move, queen d4 check. So rook f2 is the only move now, because if king h1, then I have rook, um, I have queen d1, double attack, the bishop on f1 and the rook on c2. Um, and for example, rook f, rook c1 now doesn't work because I have uh, rook takes a5, queen a5, queen c1, queen in the rook. And if um, rook f2, then I have queen to e1, double attack the, the rooks on uh, f2 and a5. And this is another advantage of my king um, on h7, because now there is no intermediate check. After rook a8, I can take the rook on f2, and rook takes c8 doesn't come with check. So I'm winning a rook here, because he cannot take my rook on c8. So he has to defend. Um, the bishop with queen c1, but then I would just take the rook on a8. So after queen d4, the only move is rook to f2. And here uh, I have rook c5. Um, basically, I force my opponent to exchange the queen for two rooks because rook takes c5 uh, doesn't work for white. I have rook takes a2, and um, I'm winning here because the because of the attack on f2. So my opponent has to um, take on c5 with the queen, d takes c5, rook takes a8. So this is a very interesting position that I saw when I played knight to d d7 on move 28, and I had to evaluate this position. Materially, it looks like y is doing very well because he has um, two rooks and a pawn for my queen. However, a closer look, um, if you look closer, you will see that White uh, is being pinned, the rook on f2 is being pinned, and um, his pieces cannot move. 
the rook on a8 um, is kind of misplaced. If it can go back to the second rank, maybe d2, then what would be fine. But uh, as of now, it's impossible to go back to defend. So uh, I correctly evaluated this position as better for black. And um, I had I had seen a plan very interesting. Um, good. What would you guys think would be the best plan for black in this position? So my plan here was to um, transfer the knight to um, bring the knight closer to his king and try to attack um, try to attack his rook. So I started with h4. The plan is to bring the knight to h5 and then to g3. So uh, I realized that when I play knight g3, he will not be able to capture my knight on g3 because of um, my pawn on h4 can recapture on g3, and then uh, the, the rook on f2 will be lost. On the other hand, if he doesn't capture my knight on g3, then that knight can go to h1 and um, attacking the rook on f2. So that's a really nice plan. Also, when the knight is on h5 uh, and g3, it's attacking f1. Um, so after h4, my opponent realized that this was really dangerous for him. And he tried to bring the rook back with b4. And this doesn't really help. Uh, I just captured the, the, the pawn on b4. Uh, it's really hard for white pieces to move because, as I say, almost no pieces can move here. Um, he tried rook a5. Okay, and I continue with my plan. Knight to h5, rook b5, queen e3, rook e3, queen e7. So I have to keep my um, the, the pin on the long on the diagonal. G1, A7. So rook B5, knight G3. I'm threatening knight H1. So my opponent tried to close the diagonal with C5, but after E6, um, rook B7, queen takes C5. This is already losing for white because there's no good way to prevent knight H1. Rook takes F7, king H6. Um, rook takes B7. If he played rook d7 now, um, then I have this move, knight takes f1, king takes f1, and queen b5, and um, winning the rook on d7. So my opponent took on b7, but then knight h1, uh, he resigned here, because um, after king h1, queen takes f2, the bishop on f1 is, only, is also lost because of the back rank problem. So... Um, for example, h3, queen f1, king h2, and I have queen a6, and also winning the pawn on a2. So yeah, my opponent resign after knight h1. Okay, let's move on to the next game. So this is the game between Grandmaster Svila and Grandmaster Tvyakov. And uh, this is a very interesting game that I would like to show you from the white side uh, to learn how to play this type of position with white. So it started with the same opening, uh, the accelerated dragon variation in the Sicilian. So in this game, uh, Grandmaster Svila decided to keep the knight with knight c2 as I told you before, this knight um, can go to e3 and d5, or maybe to a3 and b5, in case black play a5 and a4. So this move knight c2 is also very flexible and, and good for white. So bishop g7, bishop e2, 97, uh, white castle. And knight c5, uh, creating the threat of bishop x c3 and knight x e4. So bishop d2, castle, and here's Philip play a very interesting move with b4. 
So he sacrificed the pawn on e4. After bishop takes c3, bishop takes c3, knight takes e4, black won a pawn. However, white has really good compensation because um, the long diagonal is now very weak for black. So after bishop b2, um, white has really strong compensation here. And let's see, bishop e6. I think this bishop e6 is already a mistake because um, white uh, played b5 and then continue with queen d4 and f4. So the knight has to go back to d7 and g4, um, winning a piece uh, for white um, with the threat of f5 or g5. Both are black um, pieces uh, under attack. For example, if knight c5, then white play g5. Uh, trapping the knight on f6 is cannot move because of the long diagonal problem with queen h8. So uh, Tverkov played queen to b6, but then f5 and uh, and on the black got uh, two pawns for, for the piece, but it wasn't enough. And uh, Swiller won this endgame convincingly. So what I wanted to show you from this game is that uh, this idea to exchange the long diagonal bishop for, for black, the dark square bishop, for white knight on c3 is not a good idea, even though if you manage to win the pawn on e4, because uh, white has really strong pressure on the long diagonal. So um, let's move on to the next game. Um, I would like to show you one game in the Sicilian, um, bishop e5, which is very uh, popular nowadays. So this is my game against Grandmaster Wesley So. Um, I was black in this game. So after bishop b5, bishop b7, um, and exchanging the light square bishop, white plays c4. So his idea is to get the minus z by pawn structure without the dust, without the light square bishop, um, which you see that uh, the, the light square bishop would be passive uh, on e2 or f1. So he, he managed to exchange that bishop before he plays c4, uh, which can be considered an advantage for white. So, uh, on the other hand, after, after exchanging the light square bishop, black has a little bit more space to maneuver, and uh, black is also ahead in development. So after bishop e3, I play queen to c7, um, Attacking this pawn on c4. So here, b3 is the normal move. However, um, when white play b3 before castling, black has this idea with queen a5 attacking the, the, the knight on c3 and uh, queen d2, then knight c6. And castle will not be possible because I have uh, knight x e4 and winning um, a pawn. Therefore, if he play queen d2, knight c6, he probably needs to play rook d1 here, but then black will manage to exchange um, a lot of pieces and objectively, that should be fine this position. So my opponent uh, tried to play sharper with uh, rook c1, uh, indirectly protecting the, the c4 pawn, he thinks so. Um, however, I uh, I found out that I could just take the c4 pawn, and after 92, queen takes a2, I have very good compensation. Um, he could force a perpetual here with rook a1, rook b1, uh, chasing my queen, and that could be a draw. However, he tried to be more ambitious with um, knight c7, and uh, this allowed me to play knight a6, knight a8, and knight takes e4. If I play rook a8, then he has uh, queen c2 defending this pawn on e4. So I decided to take on e4 because this knight on a8 is not really going anywhere. So after knight e4, knight c7, knight takes c7, rook takes c7, I have queen a5 check. And uh, this endgame is very good for me. I'm a, a piece now, but I have four pawns for that. And that's um, very good compensation. 
So queen d2, I didn't want to exchange the queen, so I uh, moved my queen to e5. I mean, if I exchange the queen, then I try to get some um, advantage for that. For example, if I exchange on d2, then his king would be um, active in the center, um, like king d2, king d3, that would be okay for white. So I forced him to castle, and then I play rook c8. So if now he plays knight f3, I would be happy to exchange the queen, because the king is farther away from the center. And in the end game, you know that um, king activity is very important. And here I have all the pass pawns on the queen side and the center, so I should have enough compensation. So rook b1, he play, and then I play b6. He try to activate his king with king f1, and I play f5, threatening f4. So I have a lot of pawns here. And um, yeah, he played knight to b5, offering the exchange of the queens. But after queen takes d2, b2, a6, this knight is... Um, has nowhere to go. If it go to a3, I play b5 and it's stuck on a3. So he decided to sacrifice uh, the knight for two pawns. But this wasn't enough to make a draw. So I have rook to a8. Very important move to keep my a pawn alive. So if rook takes d6 now, I have a5. And this pawn is running very fast. And there's no good way for white to stop it. So he played bishop a5, trying to stop my pawn on a6. But then, okay, I have bishop e5, and I'm two pawns up. So uh, with a few base moves, I managed to consolidate my position. And here after bishop c5, I'm threatening rook a7, exchanging the rook, and then bringing the king to f7 and e6. And that should be an easy technical win for me. So my opponent resigned. So what we've seen from this game is that um, a lot of people nowadays try to exchange the bishop on b5 on move three in the Sicilian. So, and then they, they play the, the um, Maroxi structure uh, without the dash, without the light square bishop. So that is okay for white, but black can try to put um, pressure early on on the C4 pawns. And um, black, in my opinion, black get uh, playable position. Next, let's check um, another game. This is the game between Grandmaster Sotovsky and Grandmaster Jobava in the ACP Golden Classic in 2012. Yes, uh, Eliha, I see your question. So, Sometimes white uh, play h3 and sometimes they play f3. So the thing is that uh, if you play f3, you you weaken a little bit um, the uh, the e3 square. And sometimes white wants to have the flexibility to play uh, f4, so he doesn't want to waste a tempo on f3. For example, in my game, um, Grandmaster Wesley, so he probably wanted to attack on the king side with f4. So that's why he played h3 and, and f4. Um, but OK, I didn't give him enough time to do that. But usually, yeah, if white play f3, uh, black can still play queen c7, queen a5, knight c6, knight d7, trying to exchange the pieces uh, in the center. So yeah, that would be playable also. Probably um, black will have to try to uh, play with a6 and b5 in that case. Um, e5 is usually not good for black because you close the long diagonal um, and and you weaken your d6 pawn. So usually, no, black should never move e6 or e5. Okay, so uh, let's see this game, Grandmaster Sotovsky against Grandmaster Jobava. I also started with the accelerated dragon in uh, the Sicilian and Master Jubava tried a new idea in this game. Uh, he didn't want to play d6, but instead go for b6 and try to fear and channel the other bishop on b7. So uh, this is an interesting idea. After bishop b7, he is threatening knight takes d4 and attacking the, the, the pawn on e4. So uh, Sudovsky play f3, a typical move to um, protect 
the e4 pawn. So after f3, knight h5, um, queen b2, uh, blah, 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 queen b8. I don't think this move uh, so good for black because it doesn't look natural. Uh, you should put the rook to c8 and maybe pawn to b6. But in the game, he tried to play um, with queen b8 and rook b8, and maybe he wanted to, to push d5. But usually in this type of position, d5 doesn't work that well for black. So after queen b8, um, white play knight db5, attacking the pawn on d7, and also giving the square knight d5, um, trying to get the knight to c7. So Jababa played rook to d8, rook ad1, e6. I think this is already a strategical mistake because it weakened the d6 square forever. And uh, this is a very nice position for white already. So Sotovsky played knight to d6. And Jababa uh, exchanged the pieces in the center with knight to d4. However, this end game is very comfortable for white because the d7 pawn is permanently weak. And uh, white has a really nice square on, on d6 uh, for the knight. So he played rook fd1. And uh, the d7 uh, pawn uh, has a big problem now because now if bishop c6, then white has b4, b5. So black had to defend the pawn with bishop c8, but then the, the two rooks lose the connection between them. And uh, this is a very nice position for white. So he continued with b4, white play very energetically with b4, c5, and trying to push the pawn to c6. So king to f8, c5, uh, b takes c5, b takes c5. So he's threatening both bishop b5 and c6. Um, king to e7, c6. So I think white is already winning here with a lot of pressure on the d7 pawn and black pieces do not uh, coordinate very well with each other. So he had to play knight to e8 to prevent um, c7. Knight to b5, threatening c7 again. So black had to play d6, e5, d5. And although the black pawn is, um, is okay on e5 now, but his other pieces are so weak that they don't have any anywhere to go. So uh, Sotovsky play a um, very good move and he won a few moves later by sacrificing the rook on b7. Um, after bishop b7, c takes b7, the knight can also come to c6 and that's a, that's a win for white. So you can see here that he didn't even uh, rush to play knight c6 because black pieces has nowhere to go and he just want to dominate the position with rook b6, maybe knight c6 later, and the pawn on e5 stops on the castle play. So rook g8, and then he just captured the pawn on a5 first, and then go back to c6 later, um, where he played bishop b1 first, then threatening bishop a4, and then knight back to c6. So black reside here. Okay, let's uh, do one more, one last game. Um, this is my game against Grandmaster Hammer in Tata Steel, uh, the big group in 2011. So I was black in this game, and we started with the, uh, the Elish opening move order, but then transpose again to this accelerated uh, dragon variation and the matter of the bite pawn structure. So uh, my opponent keep the knight um, by going back to C2. So as I told you, Black should try to play with a6 and b5. And uh, I think this game is instructive that uh, the way I maneuver my pieces. So I play a6 and rook b8. Uh, now I'm threatening b5 already. So, so um, f3 bishop, bishop a6. b2, b7. So here I'm threatening b5 because after b5, c takes b5, a takes b5. If bishop takes b5, uh, I have bishop takes c3 and then rook takes b5. So uh, my opponents indirectly protect uh, his bishop on b5 by playing rook a b1. So b5 doesn't work now. 
because I have um because my opponent has C B A B Bishop B five and then when I take on C three he can recapture with the B pawn and has the rook defending the, the bishop on B five. So after rook A B one I realized that um, B five doesn't work at the moment so I switched to another plan and that is F five. This is also very typical for this type of position. Sometimes you play with f5, sometimes you play with b5. So this knight has go uh, to d7, so to c5. Um, I'm putting pressure on this pawn on e4. So after f5, usually white should take on f5, and that's what my opponent did. f5, so I'm killing the, the knight on c2. So the rook uh, moved to c1. It's still an equal position. Um, I have my pieces are active, but um, my pawn structure is a little bit worse than my opponent. I have three pawns Iceland, the A and the B, the E and the D, and the H and the G pawns. Uh, my opponent uh, has only two pawns Iceland, uh, the ABC and the FGH pawns. So after rook BC1, I activate my queen with queen A5. Uh, my opponent exchange the queens with queen E5, queen A5. And 94. So uh, I think it's okay for black to exchange, uh, to allow the exchange of the light square bishop. So I fix my pawn structure a little bit. And um, I still have the long diagonal uh, bishop. So f4, bishop f2. And here I found an interesting plan um, that I wanted to exchange the dark square bishops on d4. So I need to bring my knight to e6 to allow bishop d4, and that's stuck with knight to c5. So usually, if I manage to exchange the dark square bishops, then my knights are active, maybe even more active than the light square bishop of white. The e2 bishop doesn't do much in this type of position. So after knight c5, b3, knight e6, and I managed to go bishop d4, exchanging uh, this bishop. And then, yeah, then my two knights are very active. I'm threatening knight d3, so I had to go king e2. Then I have rook f5 and threatening rook g5 or rook h5. So uh, here, for some reason, my opponent didn't defend the pawn on h2. I think he should have played h3, but um, he gave away he gave away the pawn with king f1. So after rook takes h2, king g1, rook h6, I'm a pawner. Still, it's not easy to convert this position because I have some weaknesses too, like the pawn on d6. I have to play e5 now uh, to get rid of the pawn on, um, to get rid of the weakness on e7. But then the the, the pawn on d6 becomes um, another weakness, and he double the rook on the d5, threatening bishop e4 um, to attack my pawn. So I had to defend that with rook to d8. And here my opponent played knight e4. Um, then after knight takes d5, he make a mistake with knight takes e5. I think he should have taken with the rook on d5. And after knight takes e5, f takes e5, he has some threat like rook takes e5 or c5. And this should be an equal position. He should manage to make a draw with this. However, after knight takes c5, um, he allowed me to keep the knight. And uh, that's a very good position for me because I have very good attacking chances um, on the queen, on the king side, and also here I play b5, getting rid of my pawn, my weakness on b7, uh, and also exchanging his pawn on c4. So yeah, I'm a pawn up here and uh, a very strong attack. So I will a few move later after uh, knight f5, knight d4, attacking f3, and uh, he reside here. Because after rook c3, um, for example, after rook c3, I have rook h3, king f2, rook h1, and uh, it's very hard for white to defend against the threat of simply h5, h4, h3, open the king side um, and um, attacking the, the, the king. So it's a very nice win for me. And I think the way that I, I maneuver my pieces um, is quite instructive for this type of position.
so um, I hope you guys enjoy my webinar. And um, so in conclusion, I believe that uh, the, um, the Maruzi by uh, structure is uh, one of the most important structure for a lot of openings. Uh, you can get this uh, pawn structure from very uh, many different openings and different move orders as I just showed you. So it's important to know the typical plans for white and for black. I will summarize it. Um, for white, um, white can try to attack on the king side with f4, f5, um, or try to attack on the queen side with b4, b5, or c5. Um, usually you should try to do just one of the two things and uh, stay solid on the other side with b3 or f3. Um, black on the other hand can try to play with a5, a4. Um, it's, it's helpful for black to exchange a pair of knights d4 um, and then put the bishop on c6 or e6 so to put pressure on the pawn on um, e4 or c4. And then black can try with the plan also to play b5 or f5. Um, that can also exchange the long diagonal bishop, the dark square bishop on g7, and usually it's helpful for black to exchange um, as many minor pieces as possible, so you have more space uh, to maneuver your, your other pieces. Um, that's it, and uh, if you're interested, if you like my webinar and you're interested in learning uh, more on structures, uh, you can uh, buy my product, the Lim the Le Quang method. In that um, product, I will teach you about many different upon structure that may arise in your real games, and um, that will be very helpful for your tournament games. And uh, by the way, that um, that Le Quang method is um, fifty percent off right now, and uh, the deadline is midnight tonight, tonight uh, Eastern time. So you have um, until tonight to. Uh, to have a big saving on that, and that costs you only under $25 right now. So I think that's a very good deal for you. And uh, I hope that you enjoy my webinar, and um, good luck for all your tournament games, and I hope that uh, I have helped you to improve your chess knowledge. Uh, thank you very much, and have a good day.